Hey, thanks for tuning in to Love City Church Online. Please visit our website, www.lovecitychurch.tv to find information on our church, to catch up on videos you may have missed, to contact the church directly, or to support the ministry financially. Your financial support helps us reach people all over the globe with videos like the one you are about to watch. Now we invite you to open up your heart, open up your mind, lean in with anticipation, and be ready to receive God's word. We've been talking about churchology and what the church was designed to be, how God designed the church. And uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see some of these things. We've talked about the apostle, and we've talked about the prophet, we've talked about the evangelist, we've talked about the pastor, and then we talked about the teacher last week. This morning, I want to talk about a four-letter word, but we'll get there in just a minute. We're going to start here in verse 12. He says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body are being many are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13, for by one spirit we were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but it's many members. If the foot should say, because I'm not of the hand, is it not of the body? Is it therefore not part of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, is it not part of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he's pleased. And if they were all one member, then where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. For the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again can the head say to the feet that I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts, we have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it. That there uh, should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. If one member suffers, all of the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all of the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and you are members individually. Now look at this in verse 28. He says, now, and God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, which we saw in the work of the evangelist, and then helps this little, little tiny word right here in the middle of all these amazing giftings. This little word helps administrations and varieties of tongues. And he goes on to say, he goes, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all uh, uh, speak with other tongues? Uh, do all have gifts of healings? Do all interpret? Well, the answer to those questions is pretty clearly no, but he left something out here. He didn't ask if everybody was called to help. Isn't that interesting? So what he's saying is everybody's called to help. Come on, some of y'all, this last five, six weeks, you've been like, I don't think I'm called to be an apostle. I don't think I'm called to be a prophet or a, an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher. But you know what? I just feel like I'm called to do something at the VIP booth. Or I'm called to be in the next level room and help people right after they get born again. Or I'm, help, I'm called to be on the worship team. I'm called to be in a prayer ministry. I'm called to be in all these different kinds of places. How I many know this is right where you fit? Right there. This little four or five letter word. Helps. Helps. And so he's saying that all of the body of Christ, all of these little pieces, just before I came upstairs this morning, I was looking on my computer in the office and I pulled up a breakdown of a carburetor. You might say, well, what does that have to do with the message? Well, if you think about it like the body of Christ, there's a lot of little pieces in a carburetor. And you might say, well, I'm not on the outside of a carburetor. I'm not all chromed up like a beautiful four-barrel Harley carburetor. And so I don't, I, I'm just this little tiny jet on the inside of a carburetor. How many know that jet is necessary on the inside of a carburetor? Amen. The car might turn on and the engine might fire without that jet in there. But pretty shortly after it turns on, it's going to flood out. So this little tiny piece... That most of us would say, well, that, we don't even need that little, th I mean, look at that, you know. And we say, that's just very insignificant. Well, that little insig insignificant piece is the piece that keeps the car running. 
So it's not this big old fancy carburetor with a nice air cleaner on top of this huge uh, whatever kind of engine you like, whether you're a Chevy or Ford guy. Come on, it, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to include Dodge. I just Chevy or Ford. <laughs> Sorry for all you people that drive caravans this morning. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's why we stopped having kids at one, because I said there's no way we're going to drive a caravan. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just playing, Sean. I love you, man. Uh, <laughs> This carburetor needs all the parts to work right. The same way the church needs all the parts to work right. How I many you know somebody puts in information when people fill out a VIP card? Somebody uh, puts in prayer requests. Somebody emails you, and you might not even know the face that it's coming from. Somebody cleans the church. Somebody scrubs the toilets. I heard it one time when we were talking about helps ministry, uh, this one guy, his name is Tony Cook. He's a wonderful minister of the word, and he talks about helps ministry, and he talks about leadership uh, things and things like that. And Tony Cook said he, he, he had just graduated Bible school. He was so excited, and he said, I'm ready. I'm ready to be in full-time ministry. And he went to this church, and he said, hey, I just went through three years of Bible school. I'm ready to be on staff here. And the person said, okay, great. Here's the mop. And, and, and the pastor go, or, or, and Tony goes, well, maybe you didn't hear me right. I said, I just graduated Bible school. I just consecrated myself to three years of intense training of Bible school. I'm here to be on your staff. And the pastor says, well, great. Here's the mop. <laughs> and so he got hired on to be the janitor of this church. And so one day he's around cleaning the toilets. How many of y'all been there before? Thank God for people that clean toilets, amen? <laughs> and he's cleaning this toilet, and he's just getting, getting all riled up on the inside of himself. He says, I, I can't believe I went through three years of Bible school to clean toilets. He said he felt the, the or he could hear, not, not an audible voice, but you know, the Spirit of God speaks to our spirit. And so he heard in his spirit, the Spirit of God say to him, he said, Tony, you clean that toilet like Jesus is the next person to use the toilet. How I many know that's a necessary part of the body of Christ? One of the first impressions that we have as the church, any church, I'm not just talking about Love City, if people go into the bathroom and see a nasty, disgusting toilet and bathroom, they will not come back. They made up their mind before they heard the preacher. They made up their mind before the first chord was strung. They said, these bathrooms are nuts. These bathrooms are disgusting. If that's the way they treat their bathrooms, I can't imagine the way they treat the people. These little jets in the carburetor are necessary. These little things that we think, ah, oh, we could go without that. No, we need them. They're necessary. The people that help out behind the scenes, those are necessary people. The Vines Expository Dictionary has a definition of helps, and it says this. It says, one of the administrations in the local church, by rendering assistance or especially the help ministering to the weak and to the needy. I could just imagine if God was giving out callings this morning and, and God said, all right, if you want to be an apostle this morning, raise your hand. And people would raise their hand. You want to be a prophet this morning, raise up your hand and God will anoint you to be a prophet. If you want to be an evangelist, raise your hand and God will anoint you to teach you a pastor. But sometimes when we say, hey, we have an opportunity to serve down in the nursery, all hands disappear. I say, well, well how, how's God going to speak to me if I'm down in the nursery? How I many know oh, God can go beyond levels? He can go from upstairs to downstairs. He can make it, make it through the door, I'm pretty sure, on the nursery and be able to speak to you in your moment. You know, as we're, uh, you know, we've all done children's ministry. So, I'm a, you know, if you've been in any kind of ministry, usually you start in children's ministry. And so as you're starting in children's ministry and you're changing those nasty, dirty, ugly diapers, you're saying, I didn't even bear this kid and I'm wiping his rear end. <laughs> what kind of ministry is this? God, what have I done to deserve this punishment? <laughs> And meanwhile, God's saying, look, at this, this ministry is to the weak 
and to the needy. An infant can't change their own diaper. They need somebody's help to help them. You say, well, I just, I can't feel the Holy Spirit. Well, open up the wind, open up the windows on both sides and let the Spirit just flow through the windows <laughs> and get that fresh air of the Holy Ghost into the, that <laughs> nursery. Praise the Lord. So that was the Vines expository uh, definition. But I love this definition. It's the William Godby commentary on the ministry of helps. He says, oh, that's how he starts it off. Oh, come on. We've gone in churches. We've traveled all over the nation. And we've gone in churches. And I say, hey, uh, what do you do in ministry? Uh, I'm just in a nursery. Hey, what do you do? Uh, I'm just a greeter. Hey, what do you do? Uh, I'm just an usher. How many know the way that God be def defined these things? He says, oh, the nursery workers. Oh, the greeter. How many know these are all necessary parts? And the, 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 the church cannot do what it's been designed to do. Let me continue reading on. He says, oh. <laughs> Come on, he's excited about people getting in ministry. Oh, the infinite value of the humble gospel helpers. Thousands of people who have no gifts as leaders, but they're number one helpers. And they beat the preachers in working in the audience and at the altar. How grandly revival work moves along when red hot platoons of fire baptized helpers crowd around God's heroic leaders of the embattled host. Oh! You know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, the pastor isn't supposed to do everything. This is saying that when Fred or, or Kyle or Sean is out in the parking lot and somebody comes in and says, man, there's something just up with my shoulder. Can you pray for me? And Fred said, absolutely. And he prays for him. And that body is made whole right in that very moment. In the parking lot. The helper beat the pastor to the miracle. Come on, the greeter at the door. Well, I'm not feeling too good today. Well, I just want to bless you in the name of Jesus. Be strengthened from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. That wasn't me shaking their hand. That wasn't me uh, uh, proclaiming something over their lives. That was the greeter at the front door. Beating the pastor to the miracle. The pastor's not the miracle worker. The church is the miracle worker. Come on, you're, you're called to do signs and wonders and miracles. The way that Jesus said it in Mark chapter 16, he says, these signs will follow those who believe. He didn't say these signs are going to follow the pastors. These signs are going to follow the apostles. He said, you just got to be a believer. Come on, you just got to be a believer. And you say, you know what? I'm just here to help. I'm just here to help. But the Spirit of God can help you help. Let me read this one more time. Oh, the infinite value of the humble gospel helpers. Thousands of people who have no gifting as, as a leader, but they're number one helpers. And they beat the preachers in working in the audience and at the altars. How grandly revival work moves along when red hot platoons of fire baptized helpers crowd around God's heroic leaders of the embattled host. That is empowering. That is strengthening. That is encouraging. That God, if you don't know what you're called to, you're still called to help. And he's saying that you're called to help in those kind of places. Here he says, I, I like uh, this acronym of HELPS, H-E-L-P-S. He says, having enough loving people serving helps. If you're writing notes this morning, write this down. This is very important. Having enough loving people serving. All ministry, no matter if you're in the pulpit, on the worship team, uh, cooking in CHQ, ministering down at CHQ, in the nursery, uh, greeting, VIP, uh, next level, whatever ministry you might be a part of, all ministry needs to come out of a place of love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this is right after what we just read about, are all called to this or to that. It says, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, 
and I have not love, I have just become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and I can understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and it's kind. Love does not envy and love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own and it's not provoked and it thinks no record or no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rather rejoices in the truth. Love bears up all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Love never fails. So whether you're on the platform, whether you're in the kitchen, the nursery, the front door, or the front door when people are leaving, it's got to be out of a place of love. Your ministry in the church is out of a place of love. I love in, in that passage there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 how this helps ministry is a supernatural ministry listed amongst gifts of healings. Working of miracles, apostles, prophets, teachers. This little tiny word that most of us would say, that's just a little jet in the carburetor. We don't even need that little thing. And God's saying, no, look how important this thing is to the body of Christ. Helps is a gift that God has set in the church to bring to pass the vision or the goal given by God to the pastor. Helps is a gift that God has set up in the church. To bring to pass the vision or the goal given by God to the pastor. So if you're helping anyone that is weak or needy, you are operating in the ministry of help. Some of y'all that came in here this morning didn't even realize that this was a ministry. But it's very clearly listed right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is a ministry. And you are a gift that has been set in the church by God. This ministry is just as valid and just as anointed and just as powerful as the best worship team, as the best preacher, as the best prophet or evangelist or apostle or pastor. All of these gifts, they're necessary. The ushers, the greeters, the sound ministry, the media ministry. The musicians, anyone giving assistance in the body is in the ministry of helps. And let me tell you the truth. No pastor or minister to, should try to do it by themselves. Because it won't work. It won't work. No man of God can function without helpers. We need helps people around us. So just as the fivefold ministry, which we saw in Ephesians chapter 4 that we spent a ton of time on, it was placed there in, uh, by Jesus, by God to the body of Christ, so also was this helps ministry placed in the church by the body of Christ. We see the helps ministry all throughout the Bible. If you, if you flip over to Numbers chapter 11, Numbers chapter 11, we're going to start here in verse 10. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 10. This is very exciting. Numbers chapter 11, verse 10. See, that decaf is working pretty good. I'm not sweating as bad as I normally do. Praise the Lord. There was a time that I stopped drinking coffee and I started juicing. And the juice was great and I didn't have to have caffeine anymore. And then the first time I was walking around Disneyland with one of my friends. His name is Ricky. And he goes, hey, let's go to Starbucks and get an espresso. And so I don't ever just go and get a regular espresso. I get a quad shot espresso. Now, I hadn't been drinking. Yeah, I know. Oh, my gosh. No wonder how he does it. That's how he does it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's a substitute for sleep. 
Uh, and so uh, <laughs> we're, we're there, and all of a sudden, man, I'm just walking around. I'm looking for Mickey Mouse, but I am sweating like crazy, and like my heart is just thumping out of my chest, and I'm just like, oh, my goodness, i got to sit down. I'm shaking. It was the first one I had in months, and so today I've only had a decaf coffee, so that's why I'm very calm, cool, and collected. Another time when I was preaching in Santa Paula, uh, I don't know why, but, you know, sometimes when you have a wife, you run late to church. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> Uh, and I go, babe, uh, you need to drop me off at church, but I need a Starbucks before I start preaching. And so she goes and she gets me my quad shot, peppermint mocha, skinny peppermint mocha. There's no whipped cream. There's no added sugar except for all the other syrups that are in there. Uh, and so, you know, I'm just about to get up there and preach. And she puts it right there on a, we had a pulpit that had a stand on there. And so I'm just like, oh, I haven't had coffee all morning. I just, Drank the whole thing and put it back down. <laughs> that was the fastest message I ever preached. <laughs> you guys think I'm fast right now? This thing just went off like a, a matchbox man. You remember the matchbox man? I talked about his little cars, you know, that same kind of thing. And it was just a brrrr, and people were like, slow down, my goodness. So maybe I'll start drinking decaf on Sunday mornings to help you. It might help me too, praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to start here in verse 10. Back to the word. <laughs> Numbers chapter 11, verse 10. So then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families. This sounds real encouraging, doesn't it? Everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you afflicted your servant. How I many you know Moses in the Old Testament was a very good picture of what a, what a pastor looks like. It was really a, a type and shadow of what a pastor is. And so he says, why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? That you laid the burden of all of these people on me. Look what he says in this next verse. He says, did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them? That you should say to me that, uh, that I carry them in my bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I supposed to get this meat to give to all these people? For they all weep over me saying, give us meat so that we can eat. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss tale right here. <laughs> Look at verse 14. He says, I'm not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. How many know when a man of God realizes that the burden's too heavy, it's a good thing? Because here comes in the helps ministry. But he says in verse 15, he goes, God, if you're going to continue to treat me like this, just kill me right here and now. If I found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness. How many know pastors need help? Pastors need help. Verse 16, he says, So the Lord said to Moses, Gather me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them to the tabernacle of meetings, so that I may stand there with you. And then I will come down, and I will talk with you there. And I will take of the spirit that is upon you, and I'll put the same spirit upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. What was done with Pastor Justin just over about two years ago now, Pastor Tim took some of the honor that was upon him and he placed it upon Pastor Justin. He said, Pastor Justin, I need you to help me carry the burden of this people. When you were appointed to do whatever you do in the church, there was honor placed on you to do what you've been called to do. You're helping to pastor or to herd the flock of God. We see in Exodus chapter 17. Good old Mo again talking. Old Mo, you know, I like to just call him Mo. Sometimes it's just funner, you know, more fun, sorry. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, I brought this Bible. This is my one that... Um, we were at a time that we were traveling, and we had our little dog, Molly. She's now in heaven, in doggy heaven. But she, uh, 
she missed us real bad, and so she went through my bag and got my Bible out and decided that she was going to feed herself on the Word of God. <laughs> and so most of Genesis is missing and most of Exodus missing and some of John chapter 14 and 15. So she was a spirit-filled dog. Uh, when we got home, she said, Dad, I don't live on dog food alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <laughs> Exodus chapter 17. She was a precious dog. Now we just have a rambunctious dog named Steve Rabel after my dad. And uh, <laughs> they even look alike. Praise the Lord. <laughs> my dad loves it. We were still living in California when we got Steve. And uh, Ruthie just decided, my little dog, daughter, not my dog, my little daughter, seven years old now, and she goes, we, we said, Ruth, what do you want to name the dog? Steve Rabel. I go, what? <laughs> so I called up my dad pretty quickly. I said, Dad, we just got a new dog, and he's a chuggle. I said, he's a chihuahua, a pug, and a poodle mix. And uh, beautiful little, fun little dog, and soft and poodly, I don't know. And uh, with a pug snout and a pug tail and, I don't know, barks like a chihuahua, I guess. <laughs> and she, he goes, oh, well, that's nice. You know, my dad, right? You know, I think he's just watching TV the whole time. Right? Uh-huh. I go, did you hear what I said, Dad? Right? No? Okay. And so I go, well, we got a new dog. And, uh, oh, what'd you name him? I said, well, Ruth named him Steve Rabel. And he goes, I am so honored <laughs> to be named. <laughs> I don't know if I'd consider that honor. I don't know. Every time I yell at him, Steve, no, not right there. And I'm talking to my dad. That's the sad part. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's not here this morning, but when he watches it online, it'll be pretty funny for him. <laughs> I love my dad. Trust me. I honor my dad. He is an amazing man of God. In, in Exodus chapter 17 now, we're going to try to get back to the word. Praise the Lord. Come on, this is church. You can't laugh in church. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We should be able to have a good time in God. Amen. You know, the word says that where the spirit of the Lord is, that there's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So when you come underneath the roof of the church or when you're gathered together with other believers, I mean, you know, that place should just be shock full of joy. Amen. And so it's good to have fun in church. It's good to laugh in church. It's good to be excited about God in church and experience the peace of God in church. Praise the Lord. And so Exodus chapter 17, and we're looking at verse 8. We're going to go down to verse 13 here. He says, Now Amalek came and he fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand up at the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And so Joshua did as Moses said to him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Aren't you thankful that Joshua didn't rebel against Moses right here? He just said, well, praise the Lord, Moses. If, the, if you believe that that's what God's telling me to do, uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And so he went down and he fought with Amalek. But in verse 11, he said, so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So Moses' hands became very heavy. So they took a stone and they put it under him. Think about this for a minute. Moses was not a midget. Uh, Moses was not a troll. Moses was not a gnome. He was a full-grown man. Because some people think, well, they took a stone. Here you go, Moses. Here, here's your little stone. Go ahead and sit on that. That'll help you out. How I many you know this stone was big enough for a full-grown man to sit on? I don't know if you all ever tried to lift a stone lately, but they're heavy when they get bigger. And so here's Aaron and her. They said, well, we see this stone over here. I don't know. The word doesn't say how far away it was, but it says that they <clears throat> picked it up and they moved it over to where Moses was. <clears throat> Come on, you know you make grunt sounds when you pick up things. Some of y'all make grunt sounds when you're just getting out of the chair. So here's the funny thing about helps ministry, or if we just called it help, this little four-letter word, a lot of times it relates with another four-letter word, 
O-R-K. There's work that's associated with helping the body of Christ. Aaron and Hur didn't say, hey, Mo, why don't you just go over there and sit down on that rock that's a mile away? They said, no, we're going to go grab that rock and bring it over to you so that you can sit down. There was work involved here. So they took the stone and they put it under him. And he sat on it. And then Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. So that his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. How many know the church needs people like Aaron and like her? They need people. We need people to come alongside the the pastor and say, I'm just going to hold you up, man. I know that you're going through it right now. I know it's been a rough week, but I'm here to hold your arms up. I'm here to help you through it. Here, sit down here. This, I, I, I'm not going to let you uh, fight this battle alone. I'm going to hold up your arms in the midst of this battle. That's what the helps ministry does. Some of us, you know, when, when Pastor Larissa gets up here and she says, now let's pray for our city. Let's hold up our hands to God. And I know, I mean, I, I, every time she says it, I think about gym class where they started telling me to do this. You know, and they say, now Reverse. And some of us, about two minutes in, we're like, oh, my goodness, my hands are they're getting so heavy. My hands are getting so heavy. I mean, here Moses said, until the going down of the sun, Aaron and Hur stood beside him and helped him through. So the ministry of music is also a ministry of helps. The ministry of music, what this wonderful worship team does in both of our worship experiences and all of our worship experiences, they help the ministry. They help the ministry. In 2 Kings, in chapter 3, and verse 15, he says, But now bring me a musician. And then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon the prophet. And he said, Thus says the Lord. I mean, there was a block there until the musician came and played. And it opened up heaven so that the prophet could hear the voice of the Lord. And he says, Thus says the Lord says the Lord. This musician helped the prophet. So anything that has to do with the operation of the church or the ministry can come under the ministry of helps. We couldn't do here, we couldn't do what we do here if it wasn't for y'all that help. How many of y'all here this morning do something and help here? Praise God. Look around the room. That's a pretty good percentage of people helping. How many know the rest of y'all can get involved too and help in some capacity? And we would love for you to. And so we couldn't do what we do here if it wasn't for the ministry of helps. Now, if you're writing notes, and I don't know if you do or not, but this would be a great thing to write in your notes. God does not reward according to the office that we stand in. God rewards according to faithfulness. God doesn't reward according to the office that we stand in. He, re- he rewards according to our faithfulness. How you know when you get to the pearly gates of heaven and the Lord is meeting you there, he's not going to say, well done, thy good and faithful pastor. Well done, thy good and faithful prophet. Well done, thy good and faithful apostle. He's saying very simply, well done, my good and faithful servant. So he's not saying that I'm going to get a different reward than somebody who's going to park cars. I mean, when the prophet, uh, when somebody receives the gift of a prophet, when somebody receives the gift of a pastor, they get the reward of the pastor. They get the reward of the prophet. Jesus said it out of his own mouth. You can look it up in the Gospels. In Acts chapter 6, I want to go there. Acts chapter 6, we talked about this, uh, this very briefly when, we, when I first kind of came on the scene here about seven or eight weeks ago in this series uh, about Stephen. Now we see Stephen, a man full of faith and, uh, and of power, but we also see the other apostles kind of describing what they need to do. So in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Now in those days there was a number of the disciples was multiplying. And there rose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we would leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, 
whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenius and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them, on them, and the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. In Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now look at verse 8. We just know that these, these seven men were just appointed to wait tables, but in verse 8 it says, And Stephen, full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, or of power, did great wonders and signs amongst the people. In the middle of him bringing drinks to the table, signs, wonder, wonders, and miracles were happening. Sir, here's your utensils. Signs and wonders and miracles were happening in the passing of utensils, in the passing of drinks, in the passing of food, in the passing of saying, hey, is everything okay? Can I do anything for you guys? Signs and wonders and miracles. We see something absolutely powerful about Stephen. He went on to preach in these places, but in chapter 7, in verse 54, He says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. That sounds like an angry group of people. Verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. And he saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of God. I don't know if you realize this or not, but when Jesus ascended into heaven, he went and he sat down. As his work was done, remember when he uh, was crucified on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then at the end, he just said, it is finished. And his head fell. The veil of the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom so that normal people could go into the Holy of Holies. But when Jesus rose from the grave three days later, he met some people and he said, listen, my, work's here is, my work is done here, but I encourage you to tarry in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit that is going to come. He said that in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. And said he ascended, and when he w was ascended into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God because his work was done. Here's Stephen, a man full of faith and power, waiting tables, anointed to wait tables. Joe, you're anointed to drum. I believe there's more on the inside of you, but you're anointed to drum. The Spirit of God comes upon you in a way that you can drum differently when you're drumming for God than you would be drumming somewhere else. George, you, you, you sing through the guitar. The Spirit of God is magnified through that anointing that comes through your fingers. Johnny Bass, when you thump that thing, and your neck starts, you're not a good bass player until the neck starts working like a turtle. The Spirit of God is upon you, and you've been anointed to do that. Just like Stephen was anointed to wait tables. In the presence of jo uh, Johnny thumping the bass or Joe hitting the drums, how many know people's lives can be changed like this? The same Spirit of God that anointed Jesus in Acts chapter 10 is the same Spirit of God that anoints you all to play on the worship team. The same Spirit of God that anoints you to shake somebody's hand when you're greeting at the door or, to, or look them in the eye in the VIP tent and said, we're so glad that you're here today. So glad that you chose to be at Love City. Come on, that same spirit in the next level room, when people choose to give their life to Jesus and they become a born-again believer, that same spirit that is anointed to lead people in the next steps is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. 
And this same spirit that, the, that, that, that Stephen was operating in, in the midst of persecution and trial, in the midst of getting stoned. And he said, you know what? I know that this is it, but my reward's in heaven. And the Lord caused him to see a vision of the heaven opening. He beheld the glory of God. As he was uh, breathing his last breaths, I mean, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Jesus standing, given Stephen a standing ovation. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Nowhere else in the Bible does it say that Jesus stood up. Jesus stood up for a helps minister. He didn't stand up for the Apostle Paul. We don't see that in the Word. He didn't stand up for any of the other apostles. He stood up for Stephen, a man who waited tables. Now you might say, well, I don't think I can do anything. I'm not gifted in anything. I don't have any talents. I'll tell you one thing that you can do, and we'll end with this in Ephesians chapter 6, is you can pray. How many know prayer is a help? Prayer is a tremendous help. In Ephesians chapter 6, if, for those of you who know your word, you know that this is talking about the armor of God. And putting on the armor of God. But right here in the latter part of that passage, starting in verse 17, the Apostle Paul instructs the church at Ephesus. He says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And then Paul says, and I need you to pray for me. If I were to be the Apostle Paul this morning, I would put my name in that verse, talking to you, and I said, pray for Pastor Josh. That's not being egotistical, that's being a prayer warrior for the pastor. Being in the helps ministry and praying and believing God for the ministry to come forth in such a way. Look how he says, pray for me that utterance may be given to me. You don't want no teacher or preacher of the word just up here giving out what they have in their head. You want some open flow from heaven coming through, through the minister of the gospel. Pray for me that utterance may be given to me so that I may open up my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may speak it boldly as I ought to speak. Now go back up to verse 17 for just a second so I can show you how these prayers can be successful. He says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How many know that's not a period there? It's a semicolon. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The next word says, praying. Always. I mean, you know, this isn't praying out of a place of desperation. It's not praying out of a place of fear or what's going to happen. It's praying out of a place of, this is what the Word says about my situation. And this is what I'm going to pray concerning my situation. I'm going to pray what the Word says concerning this situation. I'm going to pray for my pastor in such a way that utterance would be given from heaven so that he would proclaim the word of God boldly. So it would go forth in such a manner that people would be able to receive it. And so when you're praying, don't just get caught up in our emotions. We don't pray out of our emotions. If we prayed out of our feelings, it would be like a roller coaster. Come on, some days you wake up, you feel like you're just a prayer champion. I can, I can bring down heaven today. I feel good. The next day you wake up and say, I don't even want to be alive today. How I many, if we prayed out of the place of our feelings, we're not going to get many things answered. But if we pray out of a place of the word of God, taking the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance, for all the saints, and praying for your pastor. Praying for your pastor. How I many know it's good to pray for your pastor? 
It's good to pray for your pastor. And I'll tell you what, I can feel it when people are praying for me. Prayer is a real thing. It's a, it's a tremendous thing. John Wesley said it like this. He said, nothing can happen in the earth except by prayer. Think about that for a minute. If we were to just move out on everything and do whatever we wanted to do just because it felt good, how I many you know you're just going to get yourself in a whole bunch of trouble? But if you're really believing God and you're praying things through and you're asking God to do something in your life, he cannot do anything unless we pray. Pray for your pastor. Prayer plays an amazing role in the flow of a worship experience. An amazing role. If you can, if you can learn how to on your way to church on Sunday morning, start praying. Instead of having a pop station on, listen to Britney Spears or whoever you listen to today. Say, so you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consecrate myself for just a few moments. I'm going to give myself over to heaven. And I'm going to pray out the perfect will of God. Even if you've got to put things like this, like this little prayer. On a little postcard, and you say, you know what, I'm going to pray for my pastor. I'm going to pray for the minister. If this isn't your church and you're just visiting today, pray for your pastor this way. I'm sure he'll appreciate it. Pray for him, that utterance would be given unto him, so that he may open up his mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Set yourself up to receive. Get yourself ready to expect and get, your place, get yourself into a place of expectancy. My, pastor out in, my pastor's wife out in California, she used to say, our expectation is God's invitation. Our expectation is God's invitation. Our expectation is God's invitation. Last week we talked about the teacher and how Jesus went to his own hometown and he could do, do no mighty work except for heal a few people. I mean, it was because of their expectation. They expected a carpenter to come into the town. They weren't expecting the Son of God. But Jesus could go into other towns and everywhere that he went, people would be chasing him down and crowding around him. And I think about the woman, the woman with the issue of blood who said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'm going to be made whole. If I just touch it, I'm going to be made whole. She went into places that she wasn't even supposed to be legally. And she got to the place where she just touched the hem of his garment and she's made whole just like that. The, the flow of blood dried up immediately. Why? Because her expectation was on God. Our expectation is God's invitation. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Father, we thank you for this time in your word this morning. I thank you, Lord, that this word would be planted deep within our hearts and it would produce great fruit in our lives. I thank you for those that have a call to be in the ministry of helps. This is not an insignificant ministry. This is not a tiny ministry. This is a, an effective ministry. This is a ministry that caused G, uh, Jesus to stand up on his feet and to applaud Stephen the martyr. Father, we thank you for those that are stepping in to their callings as apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers. But Father, I lift up those ones to you this morning that say, you know what, I, I don't know that I'm called to anything like that, but I think I'd just be a good coffee server. I'd be a good... Greeter, I'd be a good car parker. And I thank, thank you, Lord, for those that are in the, the house this morning that haven't that haven't started doing anything yet. But their hearts are to do something. I thank you, Lord, you know exactly where they fit in the body of Christ. Just like those jets fit in a carburetor, just like that last puzzle piece fits in a puzzle, I thank you, Lord, you'd reveal those things to them this morning. Father, I thank you for all the precious saints here, encouraging them. And at Love City Church has made great waves in this city of Gloversville and beyond, and I thank you as you continue to grow us up, as you continue to grow us out, Lord God, as we continue to expand and to stretch and grow in numbers and grow in wisdom and knowledge, growing un grow in understanding of the word that you would use us to reach our community, 
to reach our county, to reach our state, to reach this nation with the loving power of God. We thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. I need to make a couple of quick announcements before we close up today. Um, thank you for being here. Praise the Lord. I am, uh, I don't know if I tell you enough, but I'm so honored to be your pastor. Something is supernatural about when you step into the office of the pastor. The love of God comes upon you to love people that you don't know. To love people supernaturally when you've never developed a relationship with them. But you can develop relationships through the love of God. And uh, I love you all. I love this church. I love Love City. And uh, I want you to know that we are Love City. We're not here just temporarily. We are. My heart beats Love City. I wake up in the morning and I see some of y'all's faces. And they're beautiful. And we pray for you. We believe God for you. We believe that God is doing an amazing thing here. And we're so honored. Last night I, um, well, praise the Lord, answer it and tell them to get here to church. Uh, Last night after I left here, I had to do some uh, things at my office downtown, and uh, I was just sitting there and just reflecting on the service last night and just thinking about how good God is. And by the time I got done at my office, it was about 1.30 in the morning, and so I was a little hungry, so I went out to Johnstown to get something to eat because it was the only thing that opened at McDonald's at that time. <laughs> Father, forgive me, for I know not what I do. <laughs> and so... Uh, well, praise the Lord. I don't think Snyder's was open that early. Uh, so here I am just driving back from Johnstown to Gloversville, and I said, God, this is an amazing thing that you've done here. When I was in California and I saw Love City plant six years ago, I saw the first services, and I saw what God was doing in the city of Gloversville. I said, that's my own hometown. God's doing something amazing in my own hometown. And I didn't know that six years later we'd be here. I thought for sure we'd be pastoring in California for the next 30 years. At least the weather wanted us to be there. <laughs> but I just was driving down Route 30 and I just, I just started thanking God. I said, thank God. I said, and this is what I said to God. You know how many, you, you, you can talk, you don't have to talk to God in King James, just so you know. He understands normal talk. I said, God, thank you for counting me worthy to lead your people. To be a part of this tremendous work. It's just a God thing. It wasn't in my plan to be back in Gloversville, but it was his plan. And he knows what he's doing. Amen. And so, I know that this has been an interesting time of transition over these last, believe it or not, two and a half months that we've been here. Um, but God is, is amazing. And he has knit our hearts with your hearts. And I'm believing that he's knitting your hearts with our hearts. And we're going to see Gloversville totally transform. We're going to see Johnstown totally transform. And Amsterdam and Northville and wherever else God tells us to go, it is going to be transformed for the power of God. In saying that, one of the first things that we were asked when we came on board at Love City and, uh, was, uh, what are your thoughts on Saturday nights? And I said, well, I, I, I have some thoughts, but let's give it a good go round. And let's see what happens on Saturday nights. And I just didn't want to really do, do too many things. I know you all think everything's changing and everything's different. We're trying. I, I'm sorry. I'm, we're just a little bit different. But um, anyways, uh, we prayed a lot about this. This was not a flippant decision. And uh, we counseled with the spiritual counsel about it. We counseled with other people about it and, and other pastors of, that I submit myself to. Um, 
and amongst the pastoral team here, right here at Love City. And uh, we believe that it's best, and we believe that God is leading us to repurpose our Saturday night service. Uh, and the reason for that is because right at this very moment, we don't have necessarily the volunteer base to do it with great excellence the way that it needs to be done. And so when people are coming into Love City, we really want to put our best foot forward. We want to be able to make the best first impression that they've ever had when they've come into a church ever. And I don't believe that we were doing that on Saturday nights as good as we could. Now, for those of you that have served faithfully on Saturday nights, trust me, I am thankful for your faithfulness. I'm thankful for your faithfulness. And uh, we believe that we'll get you right into a place here on Sunday mornings uh, to continue to serve. But it won't even have to be every week. So that would be an amazing thing. And... Um, I know I said we're going to repurpose things, so here's what's going on. This next Saturday is going to be our last Saturday meeting together uh, for a worship experience at Love City. But we're going to repurpose it to a Thursday night at 6.30. And I'm going to give you my word that it's going to be from 6.30 to 7.30. And you'll be out of here, so if you have children, you can get them to bed before 8 o'clock. Uh, but we just want to have a place... Because right now, here's the deal. Saturday and Sunday are really mimicking services. So if you come on Saturday night, you'll experience the same thing on Sunday morning or vice versa. And I believe in order for us to really do what Ephesians chapter 4 talks about, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, we got to have a place where we can equip the believers. Right. Amen? And so our, our Sunday mornings are really geared to people who are unbelievers or newer believers or uh, just really teaching of the word uh, pretty in a simplistic manner. And I'm trying to get more simple as I go, you know, and I believe God is helping me with that. Um, but these Thursday nights, I believe that there's times where we need to get together and as a church just pray. There's times where we might need to just have a time, a whole hour of worship. Or have a time where we actually do what the word of God says that when we lay hands on the sick, they will recover and have a healing service. Or have a time where we can uh, uh, just really get into the deeper things of the word. And so uh, that's what the Thursday nights are really going to be purposed for, is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And a lot of that happens through prayer, through worship, through laying on of hands, through teaching. And uh, it's also going to give other people in the body of Christ an, an opportunity to teach which I'm very excited about. This last Wednesday night at the house, uh, Pastor Justin delivered an amazing message, a very timely message about us no longer being children tossed to and fro. It's just a beautiful thing. And so that's what's going on with that. And so starting September 29th, at 6.30, we'll be having weekly house meetings. The first Thursday of the month, we'll continue to do it the way that we've been doing it on Wednesday nights. And we'll have a potluck-style dinner and also be receiving the elements of communion. And so, uh, just so you know, our church does receive the elements of communion. And we do believe in the Holy Communion. Amen. And we do believe in showing uh, 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 that symbolization until the Lord comes again. And so, uh, we're going to continue to do that and remember the faithfulness of God. And so on Thursday nights, the first Thursday of the month, we'll have a potluck-style dinner and communion and a great time of worship and teaching or prayer or whatever it happens to be that night. But every Thursday then, uh, following from 6.30 to 7.30, we're just going to have a great time in God and go deeper together. Is that okay? Okay, two of you are okay with it. I'm glad that two of you are okay. We'll see you two on Thursday night. The rest of you we'll see next Sunday. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm really encouraged about what God's doing here. I really am. I believe that the way that God spoke to Moses and said, Joshua, you go down there, you fight the battle. And these helpers, Aaron and her, are going to come alongside. I know this transition has been interesting for some people. Some people, it's just been downright awful. It's been terrible, and it's just really bad. Some of us, we've just been, oh, this is the best thing in the world. I love it. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. So, um, But I believe that God is setting a president in Gloversville for us to be one of the best churches. I mean, no, it doesn't matter. I, I, everybody has got to be the best at what they're doing. God's called us to be the best Love City church there is. And so, last week, if you need to leave, you can leave. I know I'm going a little long here. Last week, uh, Miss Kathy Maragno came up to me after the end of the service, and she goes, I just want to let you know, She goes, four people signed the wall of rescue today. <clears throat> I just get choked up about things like this. 
Because here, when four people, I mean, these people gave their hearts to Jesus. The word says that when one sinner returns and when one sinner changes uh, their perspective on God and when one sinner comes to Jesus, that all the angels in heaven start rejoicing and heaven throws a party for that one person. And last week we had four. And so I look back there and I like from here, I could put my hand up and cover up their, their names on the wall. The prophet Elijah said it like this. He said, Ahab, I declared it that it's going to rain in this season. He said, you go up to the top of the mountain and you see if it's raining yet. King Ahab goes up. He comes back down. He said, Elijah, I don't see anything. You look it up in the book of Kings. And so he goes up there seven different times. And finally on the seventh time he goes, well, Elijah, I just saw this little cloud out there, way out yonder, past the mountains, about the size of my hand. Elijah said, that's it, Ahab. You need to get in your chariot and get to town because you're about to get rained out. (laughs) Come on, those four names on that back wall are about the size of a man's hand. And I'm telling you today, there is an abundance of rain. There's an abundance of rain. There's an abundance of souls. And it's just a sign to the believer right here. When you put your hand up and you say, those four names represent what God is going to do in these upcoming days. That the rain of God is going to flood over Gloversville and Johnstown and Amsterdam and Albany and Saratoga. Wherever God tells us to go, the rain is going to fall. Glory to God. Glory to God. Father, we declare the rain in Gloversville. We declare the rain in Johnstown. We declare that rain in Amsterdam. We declare the rain in Rotterdam. We declare the rain in Glens Falls. We declare the rain in Saratoga. We declare the rain in Albany. Let it rain. 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 rain. Hallelujah. We've been hearing so many stories of life change on how our videos are impacting people's lives, and now it's time to hear yours. Please share your story with us by emailing amen at lovecitychurch.tv. Also, please consider supporting our ministry financially by visiting lovecitychurch.tv and selecting the giving option that works best for you. Thank you for watching, and God bless you.